very encouraging as we explore the the testimony of Scripture and align our hearts and minds with that. And so for many of us, we've been part of the body of Christ for many, many years. And we have learnt and we have become familiar with the Scriptures and we are a Bible-based church. We don't subscribe to narrative voices of successive generations. It's just the Bible and the Bible alone, the full sum of God's revelation And we give God thanks for the work of the Holy Spirit to help us understand, to help us comprehend, to help us to live by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And so today I I really want to have a look at this idea of being Bible-based and where Bible-basedness leads to. Um, And I want to do it specifically from the Gospel of John. Um, I love the Gospel of John. I think his testimony is probably my favorite text. Because at the end of John's Gospel, you find yourself in John's shoes as the other disciple, the disciple whom Jesus loved. When you know just how much you're loved, you and loved by Jesus and loved by the Father and the work of the Holy Spirit in your life, it really changes us. It really compels us to total surrender and to total obedience, because God is good. As John tells us in his testimony, God is light, and in him there's no darkness at all. And that is a profundity in a world of lies, deceit, mistrust and distrust. God tells us he's holy, and he invites us as his children into his holiness. And I'm privileged to have grown up in the body of Christ, in the Sabbatarian churches. And, but there's more that's required from us than just being biblically literate. You could say, well, I keep Sabbath and I don't eat unclean foods and I, um, I do this and I don't do that and I don't do that and I do this. And so I am really aligned with the biblical narrative as best as I possibly can. And I want to show you that that's not enough. That's good. It's a good place to start. But we could just be good Pharisees. Look, I'm going to turn to John chapter 5. John chapter 5. I love chapters 5, 6 and 7. I love all of John. But in John chapter 5... We, we come down to a conversation between Jesus and the, and the Pharisees, the Jewish leaders of the day, and he's really speaking into them and their incapacity to see the Son of God. You know, John says that Jesus came into the world and though the world was made, th- was made through him, the world did not know him. He came to his own, his own people. The Hebrew people, and they didn't know him. But those who did receive him and believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So Jesus is speaking to them, and he says to the religious leaders, now remember, the oracles of God has been entrusted to the Hebrew people. They read the scriptures every day. And he says, you do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe in the one whom he sent. So the Heavenly Father sent Jesus Christ into the world 2,000 years ago and the custodians and those scribes who transmitted the scriptures letter by letter very pharisaically in that sense to use that word when God sent his son into the world they didn't recognize him. In fact they said you're doing all these miracles by Beelzebub the power of the devil. Do you remember that in the scripture? So Jesus says in John chapter 5 verse 38, you don't have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe in the one he has sent. Now the next couple of verses are ones that really hit me about 20, 25 years ago. I'll tell you why. He says to them, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. Well, ever since a boy, my dad ensured that I read the Bible regularly. Um, And The scriptures have been with me ever since I've been about five or six years of age. And I remember haughtily coming to church in the early 90s thinking, 
I bet you I can preempt every scripture the pastor's going to turn to today once I know his subject. Because it's nice to be biblically literate. It's nice to be able to quote the scripture off the top of your heart and top of your head. Those Pharisees could. He says, you search the scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life. It is they that bear witness about me. Now, what scriptures was he talking about? The Torah, the Psalms, the prophets. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. Where those Pharisees failed is they could not see Jesus. They could not see the Lord born of the Virgin Mary by the Holy Spirit. And he came to his own and they didn't recognize him. The first question that I have, do you recognize Jesus? Do you recognize his signature all through the Old Testament? Thus saith the Lord. I want to explore that because for me, I remember going to a wedding many years ago. And I'll tell you where I came from. As a bit of a sad confession growing up in the Sabbatarian church. A lovely, some friends of mine were getting married and the pastor there at the wedding ceremony said, this is not just a marriage between two people. The Lord Jesus Christ has to be the center of this marriage. And I remember thinking, well, what's Jesus got to do with it? It was just a a benign thought that crossed my mind. Like this is a marriage between two people. Why create the triumvirate image as a part of that relationship? I had a lot of learning to go. And that was a point on which I began to look at those scriptures very closely. I remember saying to my dad many years ago, Dad, Apostle Paul talks about Jesus all the time. But we don't talk about it very much in our church. He said, oh, John, he said, it was because it was fresh in their minds back then. Okay, as a nine-year-old boy, that was sufficient for me. Okay, we progress through John chapter 6 and we see that Jesus feeds 5,000 people miraculously. And the word of Jesus spread and they chase him across the Sea of Galilee to the other side. And, and the whole narrative of John chapter 6 stems from that where they're pursuing him. And Jesus says in John chapter 6 verse 27, Don't work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. In other words, you tasted some really good bread. And on the notion of that, you think, wow. Do it again, Jesus, so to speak. And so this creates an opportunity for conversation. Then they said to him, in verse 28 of John chapter 6, What must we do to be doing the works of God? That's a very good question. So you keep Sabbath and you don't eat unclean foods and you honour and worship God in the way that he... He makes it very clear in scriptures. And you say... So what do we do? What do we do to do the works of God? How do we manage this? How do we step into that space? That's a very good question. Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him who he has sent. Now that's a radical step. For those people who are familiar with the Torah, familiar with the prophets, familiar with the Psalms. They could recite those scriptures off the top of their heads because scripture recitation was very important as a part of those men um, in the positions of authority that they were. That's the work of God that you believe in him who he sent. And of course, then they're asking him to perform another sign. And the idea of the sign was, you created bread to eat, (laughs) can you do it again? It's amazing how the human heart and the human mind likes to be titillated by manifestation of the miraculous or the magical, so to speak. And Jesus reminds them then of the bread that a former generation ate. The bread that they ate in the wilderness for 40 years, manna. And Jesus said to them, truly it was not I say to you in verse 32, it was not Moses who gave you bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. And so at the Lord's Supper, we took a little piece of unleavened bread. And whoever facilitated over it, broke the bread, prayed over it, asked God's blessing, and remembered Jesus' words, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, a little piece of unleavened bread. 
Verse 33. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said to him in verse 34, Sir, give us this bread always. This reminds me of the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4, I think it is. She said, Give me of this water that I don't ever have to thirst again. In his conversation with her. And Jesus says to them in verse 35, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. He's speaking to people who searched the scriptures diligently in order that they could have eternal life. And Jesus said, those are the scriptures that speak of me. But you refuse to come to me that you may have life, eternal life. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Brothers and sisters, that's a very powerful promise by Jesus of the Father's calling and the role how Jesus responds in choosing and equipping and mentoring us. But then again, the equation is many are called and few are chosen. It's a miracle that you and I share in fellowship now, immersed in God's Word as a Bible-based Bible church and a Christ-centered church and a Spirit-led church for the glory of our Father in heaven. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So all of those scriptures, even the, the nature of the manna for 40 years, has Jesus' signature all about it. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he's given me, but raise it up at the last day. This is the first time. Now, if you read John chapter 5, Jesus, in that discourse, talks about the resurrection, the resurrection of life, the resurrection of judgment, and all judgment is being given to the Son, and then Jesus will call the names of the righteous from the graves to eternal life. And all those who didn't know God, the wicked, the malicious, the, the malevolent, will be raised to a time of judgment, and ultimately, those who are wicked, condemnation. Verse 40 of John chapter 6. This is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life. Wow. So the first question that I ask is, are you looking to the Son, the personified Logos of truth? You can look at the Scriptures, and you can search the Scriptures, and so we ought as a Bible-based church. But do the Scriptures lead us to Jesus, to his teachings, and to his person? And that's the question that we all must answer for ourselves. Because Jesus says, who looks on the Son and believes in him, total faith in Jesus, who he is, what he did and what he's doing, and he says, should have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Your life has meaning, purpose, identity only in Jesus. So the Jews grumbled, and so you see they didn't get it. Because he, why they grumbled? Because he said, I am the bread of life that come down from heaven. And so the conversation continues. And then Jesus says, don't grumble among yourselves in verse 43, verse 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. So at some point your life was drawn to Christ. I talked to a very older man who was very Bible-based. And he said to me, you know, John, you're always talking about the lordship of Jesus and the centrality of Christ, and I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me. I in you, and you in me, abide in me, my words abide in you. And he said to me, it's been a long journey, but I've been slowly coming to Christ over 50 or so years. And it was a beautiful confession from a man who knew the scriptures, but the light of Christ was shining so brightly in his confession that he realized that he'd been a slow journey. It is written in the prophets, in verse 45, the scriptures that those scribes and Pharisees were really familiar with, and they will all be taught by God. Who was standing in their midst? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
He was with God in the beginning. And the Word, in verse 14 of John 1, became flesh and dwelt among us. And we've seen his glory, the glory of the only begotten Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. So Scripture says, if you have the Son, you have the Father as well. If you deny the Son, you deny the Father. Jesus says, the Father is greater than I am, but I and the Father are one. He tells us in Revelation 3.20, whoever overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, even as I overcame and sat down with my Father on his throne throne. Jesus came from the bosom of the Father. He's our advocate, our high priest, because when we pray, we pray in Jesus' name. Whatever you do in word or deed, says Paul, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that not only the word of Christ must be exalted in our lives, but so is the person of Jesus. So how, how, how higher treasure is Jesus Christ in our lives? It's a good question to ask because everything emanates from that. All, everything about our identity, who we are, who we're becoming, what we say, what we do, what we don't do, how we touch people's lives must always be in the Bible's authority but in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not that anyone has seen God in verse 46, for the fa- has seen the Father, except he who is from God, he who's seen, he has seen the Father. So Jesus says something very profound here. I'm glad John by the Holy Spirit remembered this some 25 or 30 years later and committed it to parchment, because this was his testimony after Jesus ascended to heaven. Verse 47, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I mean, you know, the demons believe. So what's the difference between your belief and the demons' belief? Faith in Jesus Christ is truly transformative, that you surrender all. You repent of your sins. You count the cost, and you surrender to Jesus Christ as Lord of all. And it's on Jesus' name that we are ushered into the Father's presence. I am the bread of life. So this year when we partook of that piece of unleavened bread and thoughtfully imbibed it, she says, whoever eats this bread will live forever. He says, your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and died. Yes, they were eating a food that was provided miraculously on a physical level. He says, this is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. Do you want to live forever? Those of us who are not baptised, who are sitting on the fence or warming up to the idea, the most urgent thing that we could have on our agenda is, Jesus, I surrender. I repent. To the best of my knowledge, I count the cost of following you, obeying you, loving you to the glory of the Father in heaven. Because I want to live. And I get the idea from Scripture that we are God's children and God is having family. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. Right through chapter 5 and chapter 6, there's the idea of resurrection to life, eternal life. And Jesus says the only way to eternal life is through himself and that we are to Abide in Christ and his word abide in us, to remain in us. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And bread that I give for the life of the world is my flesh. And 2,000 years ago, Jesus gave his life, his broken, suffered body, to absorb into himself the sins of the world that we could be reconciled through him to our Heavenly Father. So the Jews disputed among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? It's almost like Nicodemus saying, how can I enter into my mother's womb a second time to be born again? We must listen very carefully to what Jesus is saying. 
So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. That is a startling statement. That's why baptism is so important, the most important decision that you'll publicly make. So what's your confession? Are you willing to do that? To publicly confess that Jesus is Lord of your life and to on go and doing it? Because every year when we proclaim the memorial of his death, we proclaim it until he comes to the marriage supper of the Lamb when the, what he began will reach its ultimate consummation. And we will forever be with the Lord. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And here comes Jesus' promise yet again. And I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. He says it again. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. You are, as Apostle Paul says, a new creation in Christ. Your old person was washed away in the waters of baptism and that was just the seed of the spark of the Holy Spirit given to you to start growing and maturing in the image and likeness of Christ. And Jesus reflects, as an image bearer, our Heavenly Father. As the living Father sent me, in verse 57, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he will also live because of me. You and I have life in Christ. So we search those scriptures that we may have eternal life, and all those scriptures speak of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Not like the bread your fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. So you can abide by the teachings of Scripture. You can even abide by the teachings of Jesus. But then we are called to even a higher level to be in Christ and Christ in us. That we are the hands and eyes and ears and heart of the bodily resurrected Christ manifest in the flesh on a very deep and powerful and personal level. And so there's certain questions that we can ask. Am I abiding in Christ? I listen very carefully to conversations when new people come to church. And I love the when I understand that they know who their Lord and Saviour is. It's very powerful. Others come into church fellowship, you never mention, heard the name Jesus mentioned on their lips. Have you publicly confessed that Jesus Christ is your Lord and that your identity stems from Him and His Word and His life and His sacrifice? It becomes very personal. It's not just a platonic proposition. It's who I am. It's who we are. It's who we are collectively. Do you find it a hard saying? Because Jesus had lots of disciples, 120, 70 at that time. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? The book of Hebrews says, don't harden your hearts, like the ancient Israelites did. So people were grumbling They didn't get it. They thought it was too simple, abiding in Christ, eating the bread of life. He says in verse 61, Do you take offence at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? And then Jesus tells us about the nature of the flesh compared to the Spirit. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. If you remain in the flesh even though you could be Bible-believing, unless you have the Holy Spirit and Christ dwelling in you, you have no life. The words that I've spoken to you are spirit and life, but there are some among you who don't believe. And in verse 66, it says, After this, many of his disciples turned back 
and no longer walked with him. What a tragedy. That breaks my heart. You're so close. The Hebrew people were so close. They kept Sabbath and they did all the holy things of Scripture. And when the Holy One of God, the Son of God, came among us, they walked away from him. And so Jesus looks at the twelve and he says, Do you want to go away as well? Like there was this silence. You have, we fed 5,000 people. There's lots of people around now. And Jesus tells them and speaks to them the truth of what the bread of life really is. And they walk away from it. They were happy with the physical bread. But the Son of God is the bread of life. They walked away from it. And that worries me. Because the risk factor and the attrition factor can affect us as well. And I have seen people walk away from the Son of God, yet still hold Bible-based beliefs. So Peter says, and I like Peter, he puts his hand up, his voice pops up all the time. He says, Lord, to whom shall we go? And I want to think about your response as we wrap up now. He, Peter says, you have the words of eternal life. And I'm going, amen, somebody gets it. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Peter was getting there. He knew he was the Holy One of God. It was a few steps further before... Now, we sometimes we have a few deriding words about unbelieving Thomas. But Thomas took... Peter's confession even further. My Lord and my God, cried out Thomas when he saw the wounds in Jesus' hands and his side. So Peter was on the way to understanding. Thomas still didn't get it then, but he stayed with it. And when Jesus was resurrected, the scales fell from his eyes as well. I want to leave you with a question. Where are you in your covenant relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? Because we have almost a year now until the next Lord's Supper to think and meditate and pray and repent. May we, for the rest of the year, feed on the bread of life as well. Meditate on his word and come before our Heavenly Father dressed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And so we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and Alleluia. Hallelujah.